talk about breathing, respiration. So as we talk about this, we'll be covering some things that are involved. This is me. I don't want you to get lost in that idea. Here's the secret to everything respiration involved. Already know how this works. The information here, you already know it. I know that you know it because you're currently doing it. When you inhale, air goes in. When you exhale, air goes out. We bring in oxygen, breathe out carbon dioxide. You already know this. All we're doing as we talk about this is discussing how that works and why that works. So keep in mind that you already know where things are, where things go, and really how this works. We're just making it sciencey. So the act of restoration involves going to respiratory and cardiovascular systems. And of course, the function here is to bring oxygen in and get rid of carbon dioxide. So we have the X here in the respiratory tract and then the circulatory system below. The functions here to move air in and out of the lungs, to get air close enough to the blood so that gases can move across. This is diffusion, passive transport with a gradient. More on that in a bit. And to produce sounds and participate in smell, which are less important. Now, in order to make this work, we have to be aware that there's a lot of stuff in the air that's not a respiratory gas. Contaminants in the air, and we need to keep those out of the lungs and out of the blood. And we're going to get air really close to water so that diffusion can happen. And in this situation, there is the possibility of losing water from the blood. So we get air really close to blood without losing water. We have to do this in the confines of your thoracic cavity. If you could spread out your lungs equally, they would easily cover a, a tennis court. There's a lot of surface area shoved into that thing. But there's a respiratory tract. Basically, this is divided into a upper and lower respiratory tract, right? And you can see that division there. The conducting portion is from the nose all the way down to the alveoli. The respiratory part is where exchange actually takes place, and that is just the alveoli. The lungs are contained in pleural cavities on either side of the heart and surrounded by a membrane called a pleura or a pleural sac. Much like the pericardium, the pleura are double-walled membranes that prevent friction between the lungs and the surrounding structure. Fluid-filled thing. Out of the lungs, it's right on top of the diaphragm. The lining of the respiratory tract throughout the system is mostly pseudostratified epithelium. A layer of connective tissue backing that up. That's all epithelial tissue supported by connective tissue. And through it, the majority of the respiratory tract, you'll see other tissues, cartilage and smooth muscle and elastic fibers. Mucus glands will be present with the pseudostratified epithelium to secrete mucus onto the surface of the cells. Here's our respiratory epithelium. We see this pseudostratified epithelium, these little goblet cells secreting mucus onto the surface there. What we see here amongst these Mucous cells are pseudostratified ciliated cells 
so that as this mucus gets created on the surface, it's going to be moved. And then you can, of course, going to catch debris and then move toward the pharynx where you can swallow it and kill everything in there. So here again, the respiratory epithelium, mucus catching junk, cilium moving it toward the oral pharynx or the throat so that you can be able to swallow it. So then any of these contaminants or you know, whatever that gets caught in that mucus um, dies a horrible death immersed in stomach acid. All right. Stem cells there, as with all epithelial tissue, to replace the old cells. Let's begin with the respiratory tract. The nose is the nose, right? It's an airway for respiration. Yeah, participating in smell, speech, to some degree filters air. It also warms the air and adds some moisture. Here's the nasal cavity. In the nasal cavity, we see these three bony structures called nasal concha or turbinates. They add turbulence to the air. So that as it's brought in, it, it swirls throughout the nasal cavity. And by swirling throughout the nasal cavity, you're exposing that air to the warmth from the deeper tissue and from uh, You're supposed to enter the blood from the deeper tissue and to um, moisture from the, the um, sinus cavities and then the mucus there. So all of this is moisturizing the air and adding warmth. There are lots of blood vessels here. This is a very vascular thing. If you've ever been in the nose, you're aware of the how vascular this is. Nasal hair is to help filter larger particulate matter. And of course, mucus glands to help moisten the air and catch all this dough would inhale. Breathing through the mouth would bypass all of this, leaving you more prone to upper respiratory infection. Again, respiratory mucosa here, pseudostratified epithelium with cilia that move that mucus, and air is worn by the capillaries and veins behind these mucous membranes. The sinus is here, and the sphenoid, ethmoid, frontal, and maxillary bones, hollow places in the skull. So, pharynx is divided into three parts. It goes from the back of the internal nares to the entrance of the esophagus. So there we go, the pharynx. Three parts. The nasopharynx, oropharynx, and laryngopharynx. Let's start with the nasopharynx. The nasopharynx, the air passes right behind the nasal cavity. Pseudostratified columnar epithelium. Uh, when you swallow, the soft palate and the uvula will, oops, sorry, will close over the, the airway. So here, one food's there. So the food can't go up and out your nose. Unless you're laughing or whatever, then it might shoot out your nose. But there. In the same light, the structure right here, that's the epiglottis. And it's very similar in that when you swallow food, it gets pushed down here over the trachea. The food can't go down the airway. Nasal pharynx, uh, we see the adenoids there. Laryngeal pharynx, common passageway from food to the ear, uh, posterior to the epiglottis. The larynx, um, 
I'm sorry, I skipped uh, oropharynx. Oropharynx, right? The one thing was um, pounds had lingual tonsils, and then the laryngeal pharynx. Um, the larynx is where the, the hyoid bone starts, continuous with the trachea, and keeps the airway open. Uh, let's look at there's a the larynx. So we see the hyoid bone up here. This is called the thyroid cartilage, cricoid cartilage, and then the trachea proper here. Look on the back, we see these little tiny arytenoid cartilages. There's a few of the epiglottis, and you can see how it would close. And then you see the vocal folds here. So there's the larynx. Well, we won't spend a lot of time in how the physiology of speech, um, the vocal cords are here, and as you push air out, they vibrate, producing sound. So here's the trick. That epiglottis here has to be open to speak, but you have to pour its air up and out that tube. So that as we open it, swallow, it's going to close it. Choking occurs when something gets lodged there. So if you are speaking while you're eating, it's rude. Also, life threat. That'll teach you. The Heimlich maneuver works by being positive on the abdomen and forcing air up and out of the lungs. And in doing so, hopefully expelling whatever is lodged right there. The trachea is the tube down. You see the trachea looks like uh, that. This is the trachea, the endocardial cartilage, which is muscle on the back. This structure is the esophagus, so ignore that. We're not even going to talk about it. We're just talking about the trachea. The trachea is a patent airway. The cartilage is patent or open. Here's the lining of the trachea. You see the cartilage, another layer. Once it enters the chest, the trachea is immediately going to branch off. That first branch is called the primary bronchi. So, primary bronchi, primary bronchi, those first branches. Each primary bronchi enters the lung and then branches off again. The right lung gets three secondary bronchi, and the left lung gets two. Why does the right lung get more? Because it's bigger. The heart takes up some of the room on the left side, so the left lung is a little smaller. Each secondary branch branches in a tertiary branch, and so on and so on. You get like 23 iterations here. Finally, we get into the bronchioles, which are less than a millimeter in diameter. And here we see that they're branching out. As we go through here, you're going to see some difference in the structure. When we're in the trachea, we've got these rings of cartilage. Get further down into the bronchi, those rings sort of break up, and then we see plates. Once we get down to the very tiny bronchioles, there's no cartilage left. Not only that, the epithelium will change from pseudostratified to cuboidal. The goblet cells in the cilia are, are very sporadic. Why? Because when we get to those bronchioles, the bronchioles are microscopic, and there's really not any room for mucus anymore. Okay. Now, where it's important, the respiratory part of this, where 
gas exchange takes place. These are the alveoli. Now, in the alveoli, I want you to see a bunch of these little bit. There we go. There's like 300 million of these in, in each one. And they're important. And again, we get back to this idea of form and function. The form of the structure is important for its function because this, this maximizes surface area. So instead of just like this balloon shaped thing, like outline that and hold it out, so just having like this hollow balloon, we have these walls in there that create more surface area, like so. More surface area, more possibility to transport stuff across the membrane, in this case, oxygen and carbon dioxide. The membrane is a half micrometer thick structure called the respiratory membrane. This consists of the alveolar cell. The alveolar cell here is called a type 1 cell. Then we have the wall of the capillary and the membrane in between. Them. This means that we have a single layer of squamous epithelium, one flat cell. And then on the blood vessel, we have endothelium, one flat cell. So there's not much for this to cross through. Here's this relationship between the capillaries and the alveoli. Here's the actual respiratory membrane, right? Lung cell, blood cell. One cell here, one cell there. The membrane. It's a very, very thin membrane. And the reason for that is we need oxygen and carbon dioxide to cross over. We don't need a barrier here. So we need rapid diffusion. We have these full squamous cells. The alveol alveoli themselves are surrounded by elastic fibers, which is going to help... Uh, with uh, elastic recoil, exhale, more than a bit. Also inside, you're gonna have macrophages to help keep the surface sterile. Anything you inhale can't necessarily get through that respiratory membrane. Now, some stuff everything. And so it might just end up in the lungs. So your lungs have a ready to catch anything that happens to get caught inside that alveolar. Now, there are some cells here that we haven't talked about yet. These type 2 cells, we'll talk about momentarily. You've seen lungs. They occupy most of your chest. There's the lungs. There's the lungs. Here is the bronchial tree, cast in plastic. Blood supply to the lungs, we've talked about. Pulmonary circulation. Pulmonary arteries taking venous blood out. It gets oxygenated. Pulmonary veins carry oxygenated blood back in. There is systemic circulation here. Bronchial arteries and veins take the blood to the lungs. Does it hear the lung tissue? Not super worried about. Wrapped around the lungs are sacs, fluid filled sacs, the pleura. They are there to reduce friction. Now, this is a great picture here of the pleura. It gives us this cross-section. The thing that I would ask you to look at here is where we see this double-walled membrane. Notice that this visceral pleura is right on top of the lung. That's this white structure. Here. That membrane. It's right on top of the lung. It is connected to the lung. Meanwhile, the, the parietal pleura, the one we've got here, that one there, it's connected to the body wall. Now it's a continuous membrane, right? It does that bit. So 
in this way, we've got this sort of connection between the soul and the body. Hold on, let me talk about breathing. Inspirations, inhaling, expirations, exhaling. You already know how this works. Now let's make it sound sciencey. Here is you. Better job of drawing. Show you. Here you are. I know it's remarkable. I guess. Here's here. Less of a light. All right. From the top of your head to outer space, there is a column of air. Air is matter. It has mass. So the column of air is pushing down on you. We call that atmospheric pressure. This is the pressure exerted by the air it goes from the top of your head to space. At sea level, that's about 760 millimeters of mercury. We're a little below sea level. And low, we'll go with it. Respiratory pressures are described in regards to this atmospheric pressure. So if I say you have a negative respiratory pressure, that means that it's less than the atmosphere. Positive then is more than the atmosphere. Now things to keep in mind here. This number of atmospheric pressure changes as altitude increases, atmospheric decreases. The higher you get off the ground, the less atmospheric pressure there is. So if there's you here, and this dude's up here. Well, he's much higher. There's a smaller column of air right there pushing on his head. So there's less pressure as you get higher. What does that mean? As you get higher, atmospheric pressure. The reason these pressures are important is because gases move with a pressure gradient. Gases move from high to low pressure. The higher you go, the less pressure there is, the less gradient there is. There's a reason that fighter pilots wear masks. That's pressurized air so they can breathe because the cabin of that airplane is not pressurized. Now, your commercial airliner, before you take off the ground, you hear those vents running. They're pressurizing the cabin. It's a pressurized cabin so that you can breathe at altitude. If you've ever seen any movie or TV series, Lost, where the plane gets punctured and people are getting sucked out, that's because. There's positive pressure in the plane. They pressurize the cabin. There's more pressure on the inside than there is on the outside. So if you're ever at altitude and you have a loss of cabin pressure, that mask comes down so that you can breathe. It's got pressurized air in there so you can breathe. Always secure your mask before securing the mask of the child next to you. The same is true if we do the opposite. The lower you go, the higher the pressure will be. Especially if we go underwater. You go underwater and pressure changes considerably because now you don't just have air pressure, you have water pressure pushing on you. And that's going to amplify things a lot. More on that in just a bit. So atmospheric pressure, pressure exerted by the air traveling the body, about 760 millimeters at sea level. Everything that we'll talk about is relative to that. So the first pressure we need is the intrapulmonary pressure. This is the pressure in the lungs. It fluctuates as you breathe. Gases move with a pressure gradient. We create that gradient so that air moves in and air moves out. When you inhale, you are lowering the pressure in your chest. So now the pressure inside is less than it is on the outside. Air moves in. You already knew this. You know that air moves in when you inhale. The reason? The pressure in your chest went down. When you exhale, the pressure in your chest goes up and air goes out. You already knew that air 
went out when you exhale. Now, this intraveolar pressure, the pressure inside the lungs, will eventually equalize with that respiratory pressure when you stop inhaling, when the pressure equalizes. When you stop exhaling, the pressure equalizes. Our next pressure is the intrapleural pressure. This is the pressure in the pleural cavity. It also fluctuates with breathing, but it is always a negative pressure. It is less than atmospheric pressure, and it is less than pulmonary pressure. A negative pressure, negative pressure sucks. Being on this, it's sucking it out. So, what, why this pressure is important is because it keeps the lungs inflated. Your lungs want to collapse. Those elastic fibers want to reduce the size of the lungs, collapse. There's fluid in your lungs. It wants to collapse your lungs as well. Finding that, we have this intrapleural pressure. The intrapleural pressure keeps the lungs inflated. If we equalize those, if we equalize intrapleural pressure with pulmonary pressure or intraalveolar pressure, the lungs will collapse. How does this happen? Right, so because you live in Lubbock, Chances are, statistically, you're going to get stabbed. No judgment on your lifestyle, whatever you do. There's a lot of stabbing. Like, the news doesn't report this. Um, I spent one summer in post-surgery at one of the hospitals here. And I was always just amazed at how many patients a day that we saw post-surgical had been stabbed. Okay, so you get stabbed, and what happens is we equalize that pressure. It's like kind of like not kind of popping a balloon per se, but um, you equalize the pressure, uh, intrapleural pressure here, and it's no longer negative, and now the lungs will collapse. The transpulmonary pressure is the difference between that pulmonary and intrapleural pressure. And the larger the difference between the two, the more inflated the lungs are. Here's this. So here's your intrapleural pressure, which is always negative. Intrapulmonary pressure in the lung. And then transpulmonary pressure, the difference between the two. Atelectasis is the term for a lung collapse. Again, this typically happens when you get stabbed. The lung will collapse. If you puncture the lung, air can then escape the lung and go out here into the pleural cavity. Well, if that air is out there in the pleural cavity, you can't exhale it because it's not in your lungs. And so what happens is the air escapes here and it starts to build up because it can't go anywhere. It's trapped in the chest. And it starts to build up and build up and build up. And as it does, it squishes the lung. And it collapses the lung even further. <laughs> Air in the pleural cavity is called pneumothorax. And before the lung can be reinflated, they'll have to let that air out by putting a tube in your chest. So, when you inhale, air goes in. When you exhale, air goes out. Why? Well, pressure changes. What causes pressure changes? Volume changes. Volume changes cause pressure changes and pressure changes cause the movement of air so the physics here is called boyle's law pressure varies inversely with volume translation volume goes up pressure goes down what happens to your the volume of your chest when you inhale? Inhale right now. Do it. Did you do it? I'll give you a second. All right. So you inhaled. When you inhaled, what happened to the volume of your chest? It went up. So the pressure inside went down. Where did the air go? In. It went from high to low pressure. So inhaling, you increase the volume of the thoracic cavity. Exhale, you decrease it. A great example of this visually, and we were 
in class. You this would have to is the uh, mechanism of an accordion, and when you stretch out an accordion. You let air into the bellows, and when you push it, air goes out. When you stretch it out, you're increasing the volume. When you push it closed, you're decreasing the volume. So you stretch it out, air goes in. You push it closed, air goes out. And yes, I own an accordion. Not it's not like a big piano accordion. I got rid of that one. I had one of those. I didn't like it. So can I eat an accordion? Can I play it? Oh no! I have no idea how to play it. I can't even remember how to make it. Great. You're welcome. I can make it make noise. I forgot how to make it. But I own it. So it's a visual aid. So carrying that in the class with me. Alright. Incidentally, if anybody knows how to play the cage accordion, let me know. Or you can teach me. That'd be more impressive in this video. Inhaling. And again, inhale. That's active. You have to use energy to make this work. The diaphragm contracts. It goes down. Volume increases. Exhaling. Exhaling is usually passive. Now, the forceful exhalation is different, but normally exhaling is passive. All that has to happen, stop inhaling. When you stop inhaling, those... Elastic fibers recoil, the volume goes down and air goes out. Here's a graph of the pressure. So pressure goes down, exhaling, pressure goes up. So the reason that inhaling is active is because you have to overcome some of the forces that are working against the movement of air. The first of these is resistance. Resistance is the major thing that you'd have to beat. And just like uh, blood flow, resistance is the opposition to flow. Meaning that the higher the resistance is, the less flow there is. Not worried about the math here, but for normal physiology, Resistance is insignificant. The trachea is gigantic. And it branches off infinity times. There shouldn't be any resistance. And by the time you get to the, the bronchioles, the terminal bronchioles, there shouldn't be any resistance at all. Resistance only becomes significant when we have some sort of con uh, constriction of the bronchioles. We have bronchoconstriction. The airway gets smaller, something like asthma. As that resistance goes up, it's harder to breathe. Imagine breathing through a straw. That's resistance. So, constricting the bronchioles, like asthma, um, causes increased resistance and makes it difficult to breathe. The next thing that we have to beat is the surface tension. Surface tension is the attraction of fluid to itself in the lungs. Um, your example for this, take a, like a, a Kleenex and, and get it wet just a little bit, fold it over on itself. It sticks to itself. The water is attracting itself. Your lungs are thinner than that. And the moisture would attract itself and collapse the lungs. Luckily, we have in the battle that we have something called surfactant. Surfactant is made by those type 2 alveolar cells. 
And what surfactant does is it reduces the surface tension in the lungs so that fluid can't stick to itself. Surfactant becomes an issue in premature infants because you don't actually start producing surfactant until like the last couple of weeks in utero. So premature infants might be born before they've started producing surfactant. And then we have infant respiratory distress syndrome. We have synthetic surfactant, obviously ventilators and things that help with breathing until that kicks in. The last thing that you have to beat when you inhale is compliance. And compliance, sciency, is the change in lung volume that occurs with a given change in transpulmonary pressure. English, it's how stretchy the lungs are. All right, so, um, you know those balloons that, that clowns blow up to make balloon animals? You ever tried to blow up one of those things? Just another reason why clowns are unnatural because those balloons are hard to blow up they're not very compliant it you put the, all the pressure on it you want to and it's hard to get air in there now other balloons they're very compliant it's easier to blow them up compliance is the change in volume that occurs with that change in pressure and the lungs are the same thing. Now, normally, compliance is irrelevant as well because it should be really high. The, the lungs are super stretchy. They're very, very soft and spongy and stretchy without any surface tension. Lung compliance gets diminished when scar tissue builds up in the lungs or when there's not any surfactant produced and the lungs do sort of collapse on it or when the rib cage doesn't move correctly. Thoracic deformities, even broken ribs, can cause a decreased amount of compliance. The lungs can't inflate all the way because something's damaged. Now, clinically, we use different things. We have respiratory volume, tidal volume, inspiratory, extra reserve volume, residual volume. These are actually things that, in a normal setting, we would talk about in a lab. And we would look at this. Now, the lab stuff that we would have done in the past with this, um, I actually disposed of this semester that involves you breathing into a tube that you know everybody else uses and in our situation that's not going to work ever again um in a clinical situation there is a computer and you breathe into it and they have you breathe in different patterns and they measure these different volumes uh, of of note tidal volume is the amount of air moved in and out with each Inspiratory reserve volume, how much air you can inhale after you normally inhale. So, inspiratory reserve, how much more air can you inhale after you normally inhale? What's what you have? Expiratory, the opposite. When you exhale, how much more can you exhale? And residual volume is the amount of air that's always in the lungs, even after you inhale as much as you can. We have lung capacities. Um, total lung capacity is just what it sounds like, the maximum amount of air you can put in the lungs. Vital capacity is the maximum amount of air that you can exhale. Suck in as much air as you want, blow out as much as you can. Inspiratory capacity, how much air can you suck in after you exhale really hard? And then the functional residual capacity is the amount of air that's remaining in the lungs after normal breathing. These different values allow us to distinguish between different types of respiratory diseases. For instance, um, someone with an obstructive pulmonary disorder where uh, resistance has increased will have different values than someone with a restrictive pulmonary disorder. And if we have a chance, we'll talk about that in just a minute. Some of the air that you breathe never actually is going to contribute to actual respiration. It's what we call anatomical dead zone. That's air that's in the conducting zone that never gets down in the lungs. Um, so a spirometer is what we'd use to measure this, or a respirometer. Um, and then we can distinguish between obstructive and restrictive diseases. Um, 
other function tests we do here, minute ventilation, forced vital capacity, or expiratory volume. Increasing total lung capacity or the functional residual capacity may be obstructive. Uh, decreasing vital capacity and total lung capacity may be restrictive. Like I said, if you have a chance, we'll look at some of those. Uh, alveolar ventilation rate, how much is moving in and out in a time. Interesting thing here. Here's normal respiratory rate, 20 breaths a minute. Your minute ventilation rate is about 10,000 milliliters a minute. Your alveolar ventilation rate, about 7,000. That means your effective ventilation rate is about 70%. About 70% of the air that you breathe in is actually being used for ventilation. The rest of it is in the dead air. Slow down your breathing, cut your number of breaths per minute and a half, and you only raise that percentage by about 15%. You don't get a drastic improvement by breathing slower. Now, breathing faster does create a rapid decrease in that effective ventilation. Non-respiratory air movements, moving, or like coughing, sneezing, crying, yawning, that sort of thing. You're asking it now, why do you even yawn? I don't know. There are lots of theories that are hypotheses that get tossed out there. One was that it increases your blood oxygen levels. It does not. All right. We got air in, bring air out. So now, how do we get oxygen into the blood and carbon dioxide out? To understand this, we have to understand the physical properties. Of this. First thing, Dalton's law of partial pressure. Dalton's law of partial pressure tells us that the total pressure of a gas is the sum of the pressures by constituents. Air is not oxygen. Air is about 79% nitrogen, about 21% oxygen. If the atmospheric pressure is 760 millimeters of mercury, and it's 21% oxygen, that means oxygen accounts for 21% of that 760. Here's the math in carbon dioxide and water vapor, but if oxygen is about 21%, that means the partial pressure of oxygen is about one of 760 millimeters of mercury, that's atmospheric pressure, about 150 of it came from oxygen. The next thing is that when you put a gas in contact with a liquid, the gases may dissolve in that liquid dependent on their pressure. Man solubility. So, if I take water and I take carbon dioxide, I can make that carbon dioxide dissolve in water by pressurizing. So, gases move with a gradient, always from a high to low pressure as a partial pressure. Keep in mind, as we talk about this, you already know where the stuff goes. At the lungs, where do you want oxygen to go? In. Tissue, you want it to come out of it. Conveniently, that's the direction of the gradient. Inside the alveoli, there's more carbon dioxide and water vapor than the atmosphere. Where does it want to go? Out. 
luckily, you're agreeable to that. So you already know where this stuff goes. Notice here is nitrogen. Isn't that only chain? That is minimal. Even though nitrogen's got the highest partial pressure, it doesn't really dissolve in your blood. You don't have enough pressure for that. It takes a lot more pressure to get nitrogen to dissolve in your blood. Go scuba diving under the water. You get air pressure, but you also get water shoving stuff in your blood. And you might make that nitrogen dissolve in your blood. Nitrogen. Narcosis is the term that applies here. Something that happens is scuba divers, they are at depth for a while, and the nitrogen dissolves in their blood and it makes them drunk. And there's nothing like being drunk and way under the water. You're going gonna to drown or taught the sharks or something. As you come up from depth, you have to stop along the way. Decompression. And that's because as you go down, you can force that nitrogen to dissolve in your blood. And as you come up, you have to give your time to exhale that nitrogen because you don't want it to bubble out in the blood. This principle is much like opening a Coke bottle. When you open it, what happens is that you decrease the pressure really quick. Carbon dioxide that had been forced to dissolve in the, the, the water leaves really quickly. All right. Okay. So if this is a thing, we're worried about getting drunk underwater and drowning, or we're worried about nitrogen bubbling out in our blood as we come up, that's how deep compression bends. Why don't we just breathe pure oxygen if we go scuba diving? Some divers do. But they are typically military. And when divers breathe through oxygen, it is to slow those decompression stops so you can come up faster. The reason that we don't do it normally is because under pressure, oxygen becomes toxic. It's called oxygen toxicity. It's a free radical and it becomes toxic and it can kill you. So you can only breathe pure oxygen limited amount of time. External respiration is this exchange of oxygen and carbon dioxide driven by these gradients and solubilities. Let's look. The gradient for oxygen is really steep. So the venous blood here that's coming back to the lungs from the heart has a partial pressure of oxygen inside of about 40 millimeters of mercury. Inside the lungs, it's about 104. There's like 60 millimeters of mercury shoving oxygen into your blood. Now, as that leaves, it becomes arterial blood again. Um, it has a higher partial pressure of oxygen, and it will go out to the tissues, and the tissues will have a lower pressure, and then the oxygen will move to the tissues. You already know where stuff goes. Oxygen goes from the air, lungs, the blood, and conveniently, that's the direction of the gradient. Pressure is highest here and lowest here. Gases move with gradient. From high to low pressure. The partial pressure gradient for carbon dioxide, not so much. In the venous blood, it's about 45. And in the alveola, it's uh, 40. 
Why is it so 